And it was silent. And all I could say is, this be the wrong church. <laughs> oh. You know, I had to stop singing because first time that I can say I truly heard all of you singing and I could hear your voices and it just touched my heart uh, to hear you sing so loud unto the Lord and it just stopped me from singing myself to hear it and uh, you know I don't know what uh, touches us most but I know that God hears our every worship hears our every praise and it's a sweet sweet anointing it's a sweet sweet savor unto him and it ascends unto the father he hears it and he's pleased boy that touches my heart gave me goose pimples and I don't know if there's any na announcements just a couple. Uh, we have City Lights this week, so those who are involved in it, um, if you could please come. Um, I'm going to be out doing a procedure that day, so I'm not going to be uh, available to go. So those who are otherwise involved, please uh, support it, Sister Garland, and speaking of it, I know Sister Edward is going to be there, but possibly please do the committee handy. So it's, it's always a great ministry. Uh, reaching out to these rooms and home of shelter at City Lights. And so if you, if you'd like to come, you know, you're always welcome to and we can give you information about that. Also, we just have our regular services uh, tonight and um, on Wednesday we have our Awanas and our Bible study for those who are in the Awanas. So, um, God is good. The month is just flying by. Amen. And God knows how to bless His people. Amen. You know, I have a friend in church. His name's not going to be mentioned, Clint. But um, every year he shoots his elk and I get jealous. Then I have to go to the Lord and ask him to forgive me. But uh, I had something happen this week. I told a couple people, you're going to love this. So the first thing I got, I go, caw, caw. How many of you know what that sounds like? A crow. Well, we have this habit of following the sound of a crow when we're hunting. We go out hunting. And Brother Kim says, I'm following those crows, man. I don't know where they're at. And I just was following the sound of the crows. I was lost. I don't know where the road is, so I'm just following the sound of the crows. And I thought, well, that's good. You know, that'll send you north and you'll be looking to go south. But it wound up, these people shot an elk. And how many of you know some people go hunting and really don't know what they're doing? Well, here we are. And he says, Chip, look at that. And they cut the legs off of this elk but that's all they did so you want to know what your pastor did I grabbed that carcass and threw it in my truck took it home and said thanks God for your provision of elk called the game warden he said well if you want you can have it and I said thank you I already started cutting on it now, some people say, oh, man, you're going to eat something that was just laying there dead. Well, what do you think it's going to be after you shoot it? You're going to be laying there dead. So I know what's good and what's bad. I've, I've been out there long enough, and it had just been uh, taken down because we'd gone through, and it wasn't there, and came back, and there it was. God provides in ways we don't understand because he's a mysterious God but yet his people understand his mysterious ways. It says, delight thyself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And I've believed that since day one and I used to put that on my hunting text. Then one day I thought, well, I don't need to do that anymore. I'm not that young in the Lord and 
He knows my heart. Ever since I quit doing it, I haven't shot an elk. <laughs> but God gave me some anyway. But here's the interesting thing. Not many of you in here would do that. But when God provides, will you pass up His provision? So I want to talk to you today, just a little while. I want to talk to you about a word. It's an interesting word. If you follow it in the Greek, it's sodeszo. But if you hear how it's pronounced, it's sozo. Can you say that? Sozo. S-O-Z-O. Although if you look at it, it's scribble dot dot dash scribble scribble. That's Aramaic. And when you look at this, it tells you that you have a great salvation. Because that's what it's talking about is salvation. It's the word that means I am saved. Ask me when I was saved. I'll tell you I was saved. When was I saved, honey? 1982, in January of 1982, I was saved. In 1996, I was saved. In 1998, I was saved. In 2001, I was saved. In 2012, I was saved. In 2016, I'm saved. Today, I'm saved. Tomorrow, I'll be saved because I'm going to give it to God. And it's a great salvation. It's a great salvation. Greater than people understand because they don't understand God sometimes. And it's just like that time with that little bitty provision that somebody would say, I'll never touch that. You know what? I remember a story in the Bible where the man said, if only I could get the crumbs that are at the table, I would be satisfied. But I share this with you to let you know that whatever God provides for you, it'll be enough. It'll be enough. But when it comes to our salvation, how many times have people looked at it and said, well, you know what, it wasn't that much. I've been saved my whole life, and I, I got saved when I was a kid, and I'm saved now. I'm a preacher's kid, and I have saw it all, and, and you know, it's not all that. I've played the game but meanwhile, they passed up even the slightest provision of God with no thanks and no joy in the heart. Interesting, isn't it? The salvation of the Lord comes to those who understand one thing. Without Him, there is no life. Without him, there's a sure death. Without him, you will remain without deliverance. Without him, you will remain without victory. Does that mean I'm going to do everything and be everything I'm supposed to be? No. That's why I'm saved today. I'm saved tomorrow. And I'm saved the next day because I'm going to fall on my face before God each day and say, God, thank you for this day. Keep me from all harm. Hold my salvation sure, Lord. He says we're in the hollow of his hand. Great is our salvation. I want to share with you Matthew, the first, uh, Matthew, the first chapter, the 21st verse, an interesting setting. And I want to share the salvation in the traditional sense of the word, sozo. And as I share this in Matthew 1, 21, I want you to see this. And this is the angel talking to Joseph. Okay? She will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. Because he will save, so so, his people from their sins. 
He will save his people from their sins. How many of you know that without Jesus, sins remains in the heart? Forget it. This thing's driving me nuts. Sin remains in the heart. People don't change. Well, wait a minute, brother. Does that mean I need to quit this, quit that? I didn't tell you to quit a thing. I told you to become a bond servant. I told you to get in love with Jesus and fall in love all over again and find out that when you're in love with Him, things will change in your life because He becomes the sinner. My wife and I were looking at divorce. We were looking at a hard place in our life and something came over me. And my wife looked at me and she said, Chip, I'm going back to church whether you go or not. I knew what she was saying was, I am not going to follow this life anymore. I'm not going to follow you through the gates of hell I'm going to follow Jesus if you want to go, go but if you want to come, come but don't stay where you are I think she almost fell backwards when I said I'll go I'll go sure I'll go, let me get prepared first so I got myself prepared three times and headed off. But see, it started long before that. I was 18 years old with her grandfather and she drugged me off to Central Assembly. Has anyone ever heard of that place? I think they're tearing it down. I'm not sure. But one thing I found out there was when Roland Buck was alive and I was 18 years old, they had a cross up on the wall and that cross chased me all the way out of that church. Don't you even think I'm psychotic. <laughs> I might have been on something, but I was not psychotic. But I began to feel something I'd never felt before. I began to experience something I didn't have in the Catholic Church. I found something that was more important in my life, but I let it go. And it was only three years later, my son's laying in a coma. And I went home and I sat at my table and I said, Lord, I said, if you'll save my son, I'll serve you. I promise I'll serve you. And my son came out of the coma. And I didn't keep my promise. I thought. And when I went to that little place again, when Nancy said, well, where do you want to go? And I said, I want to go to that place we went, where the cross chased me out. <laughs> I got there and there were way too many people. You see, I didn't like people. I have a hard time still. And it's only by the grace of God that I even deal with people. Because you see, in our lives, sometimes we get hurt beyond repair. But it's only through the grace of God we find healing. Yes. And traditional sense, sozo, salvation. And we become saved. And we wound up leaving up here about a quarter of a mile passing this church, going all the way over to Central Assembly, only to turn around and come back to this church. And I came to this church for three weeks. And there was something that was happening in my life. And maybe this is talking, I know I'm talking to somebody. I know I am. I know you're here. I'm talking to you. You made a promise to God a long time ago. And you've walked a path you never thought you'd walk. You've walked a path you never thought you'd walk. But Jesus will be the name that will save you from your sins. 1 Timothy 1.15 says this, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance, church. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Let me tell you something. I sinned yesterday. But don't you point your finger at me because so did you. Come on. Ooh, pastor. 
Master, you called me a sinner? Yes, I did. Because if you can go a whole day without sinning, what are you doing here? And why aren't you preaching? Come on! <laughs> Wouldn't it be preaching? <laughs> well, Brother Miller, I didn't lie. I didn't cheat. I didn't rob a bank. I didn't gossip. I didn't steal. Oh, somewhere along the line, you thought, did, or... You know what I'm talking about. Come on! And I went to church here about the sixth week I got here. You're going to love this. Drive up to my car. Someone steals my tape out of my car. Oh, I'm mad. I come back into the church and I find that pastor and I say, somebody got my car and they took my tapes and they even took the one out of the tape deck. <laughs> and he said, Brother Miller, he had a smile that I hated. <laughs> he had this constant sort of uh, really? <laughs> and he goes, don't, don't, don't you know, sin and torture. <laughs> I didn't want to hear that. I just got saved. I thought I was born again. I had a party. Everything was new. And I'm not going to sin no more. I'm going to have this tiptoe through the tulips. <laughs> Only to find out that some things just are like Klingons. They just cling on. They don't let go. So you have to lay aside the sin that does so easily beset you. You have to put it away. You have to crucify it. You have to set it at the cross every morning, every night. Put it at the foot of the cross because it's at the cross every Thing is made whole. Because Jesus said it is finished, which means that it's so, so We were saved at that cross. When He gave His life for you and for us, we found a salvation sure, and it is so, and will never change. Come on, hallelujah. Never change. We have to realize that in our lives. There's times in our lives where we don't realize that Sinners go to church. And sometimes we don't think we're sinners. And we fool ourselves. But we make a promise to God. And we don't keep it. So I come back to church not long after that. And I say, Pastor, i got to admit something. i got a problem with women. I got a problem with drugs. And he looks at me and says, maybe you're going to be a preacher. That wasn't a very good answer. And then I said, but pastor, the worst thing of all is I promised God seven years ago that I'd serve him and I didn't keep my promise. And here he comes with that smile again. He says, Brother Miller, your time is not God's time. For 18 months, I never got off of that place every service. I got more snot and tears right there than anybody. Right there. So when people come up and you see they don't go there anymore, you'll know why. <laughs> yeah, we have it reupholstered, but it's been cleaned. But then again, a lot of people have been on these altars and shed a lot of tears because, truthfully, I went to my next pastor. I had three pastors in 18 months in this church. And it was like, Lord, have mercy. Does anyone stay? And God called me, and I told my wife. I said, I'll be doing that one day. 
She said, what's that? And I said, that. And I pointed to the pastor up here. Can you imagine what my wife thought knowing me? Settle down, son. You'll be okay. 30 years later, she's still going, settle down, son. You'll be okay. But I want you to know something. Say the word acceptance. Now look at somebody and say, God accepted me. I didn't say accepted, I said accepted. God accepted me. He knew not only the good in me, but he knew the bad in me. He loved me before I could even love myself. And it was at deliverance one day I went, I can't take this anymore. And the Lord began to work with me. Now see, I'm, I'm using me, because if I use you, you'll be real mad. But they say confession is good for the soul, and my wife's going, shut up, I don't want them to all know that. <laughs> but the most important thing was, I looked at my pastor, tears rolling down my eyes, and I said, Pastor, when do I get to get up off this altar? Eighteen months. Every service. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. At home. Eighteen months. You say, how do you remember that? Because I know when God changed me for good. And I was delivered. And he said... When you quit your sinning, but don't think you're not a sinner. You see, when God delivered me, He delivered everything about me. Does that make me pure? No. But it makes me receive a robe that is spotless. For when I see him face to face, will he say, depart from me, I never knew you? Or will he say, welcome in to the joy of the Lord forevermore? And I begin to look at this and I see that this is clearly in Timothy where it says, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And I look at that and I see that it means to be born again. It means to be saved Sozo. This is clearly the single most important sense of the word sozo. That is being saved from the penalty of eternal judgment due to our sins. Do you need me to say that again? Someone need me to say that again for you if you're writing down notes? There it is right there. It's the most important sense of the word sozo that is being saved from the penalty of eternal judgment due to our sins church that's not the full scope of the word that's only the traditional scope of the word but salvation is also the sense of rescue anyone ever need to be rescued how many remember the storm where Peter was in the water? He said, I'll walk on the water to Jesus. Jesus said, come. And as he went and he looked at the wind and the waves and it got too much for him and he began to look at the cares of the world rather than to look into the eyes of Jesus and keep walking forward toward him, he began to see that all was boisterous. That's the things that are around us that keep us from being able to to see Jesus. It's the little fires of our life that keep us from seeing Jesus. It's the little things that go around everywhere that keep us from seeing Jesus. It's those things in our life that we don't want to do that we do. And it gives us a complex. And we find ourselves feeling that guilt of sin and it never goes away. But when we get rid of that, again, that guilt complex, we find ourselves free indeed. Guilt is the gift that will just keep on giving. 
But when you lose that guilt consciousness and you realize I'm no longer guilty, eternal judgment is not for me. I've been saved by the blood of the Lamb. I've been rescued as Peter was pulled from the water. I was rescued from the waters of sin. He reached out to Jesus' hand and Jesus caught him. Isn't it good that when we do find ourselves in that place where we need a rescue, Jesus is putting out his hand to pull us out, to lift us up. Lift me up and let me stand by faith in heaven's land. Church, can you hear me this morning? This ain't the end of it. This is just the beginning of it. Sinking Peter looked out to the Lord and he said, Sozo me. Because they didn't speak in English, church. He said, Jesus, sozo me. Save me. How many of you had to reach out and see that God was the only one who could do what needed to be done in your life. Salvation also comes in deliverance. In the form of deliverance. God delivered me from those things that I used to have problems with. God delivered me. Well, wait a minute, Brother Miller. I thought you said sinners go to church. Yeah. But did we realize that some things we don't want to do anymore? We can have all the fun in the world, but we can't sin. Some people think if they get saved, they've got to be miserable. Some people say, give the pastor five bucks. It was worth that. I paid my dues. He'll make it. And let me tell you something. You can't outgive God. God will send you by the hand of the raven what you have need of. Elijah, now you hear this. You'll see a skeleton. You'll see a carcass. And you'll go by it. Now, some of you are starting to get the picture about the representation of the carcass. Some of you are seeing the metaphor. Because you see, Elijah was in a place where he had people looking to kill him. And they looked here and yon, and right under their nose by the brook Cherith, he sat and he waited for God. And as he sat and he waited for God, God sent the raven to feed him. Church, do you hear what I said? God sent the raven to feed him. I'm not going to eat what the raven eats. I'm not going to eat what the raven drug to me. Really? I can tell you about men, more than one in the Bible, who ate what the raven brought. I can tell you that the raven was very important in the scheme of things when it came to the ark. Church, we bypass many things of our life and don't look at the carcass of our life. The carcass of our life is this. Life is not just meat or drink. Life is more 
It's vital. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. And it's great through the salvation of Jesus Christ. I'd rather be saved. <laughs> oh, church. What a great salvation we have. Oh, a great salvation. And we're kept safe. Timothy, the second Timothy 4.18 says, The Lord will rescue. Sozo, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely. Sozo, bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. Church, it says that he's going to save me. He's going to keep me safe. He's going to deliver me. He's going to keep me. There's times in our life where we just have to go back to that altar and say, God, forgive me. I'm a sinner and you're saved by the grace of God. 1 Timothy said this in the second chapter, first 15th verse, but women will be kept safe through childbearing if they continue in faith love and holiness with propriety what does that mean god will save women he will keep them safe in the process of childbearing and i'm telling you we need more ladies having children in the church because if we can't get them in the church we'll create children in the church and god will bring them up and we'll give them love. And we'll be their grandmothers and grandfathers, their aunts and uncles. We'll show them the way. Now, how many of you feel like sometimes there's a demon that just keeps bugging you? I'm going to get real downright nasty here. Did anyone see The Exorcist? before you got saved. <laughs> Head twirls around, pukes out all kinds of, ew, horrible. Don't watch it, it's terrible. Priests coming in, getting slapped against the wall, duh. You want some help, get somebody who knows the Holy Ghost. You want some help, get someone who's filled with the Holy Ghost and with power. Amen. No, thank you. I don't want to change my settings. Isn't that good? Right in the middle of a sermon. But I want to tell you something here. Luke, the 8th chapter, the 36th verse. Those who have seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Now, I'm bringing up a, a set of Christ of. I'm bringing a setting of scripture from the end of Legion. A man who ran through the graves and said he dwelled there naked. And when Jesus came to that place, he walks up and it says to him, are you here before the time? And he stands there in front and he said, what is your name? And he said, my name is Legion, which means there are a thousand. Could you imagine the torment of that man's life? But Jesus came and cured that man. And the people, now here's the church. See, you have this man out here getting saved, but then the church, okay? Actually, synagogue of the day. They were keeping pigs. They weren't supposed to keep pigs. They weren't supposed to eat pig. Matter of fact, they weren't supposed to eat pigs. But here they were keeping pigs. Jesus goes, the, he cures the man that they have a problem with. You know, sometimes there's someone in the church that has a problem with somebody else, right? Meanwhile, in their own life, there's a ravenous wolf. 
But here's the interesting thing of it all. When he cured this man, he said, if it be so, send us into that herd of swine. And he said, it's so. And they went, and they, the pigs knew better than to live in it. And they jumped into the ocean and killed themselves. Church, I'm here to tell you, God saves. God saves those who are willing to say, I'm tired. I'm sick and tired. I've had enough. I'm over it. I want to go on. I want my life to be right. I want to live a life that's beyond me. I want to live a life that's going to give me the peace within my heart I need. And I need deliverance from God. And I need to be safe in God. And I need to have that healing in God. And I have that divine healing in the word save, salvation, sozo. Receive your salvation. And become one in the palm of of God's hand. If you're here today, you may know what I'm talking about. And don't think while I was up on the hill, I was thinking about anybody who was going to be here. Isn't that just like the devil? Well, he knew I was going to be here today. Don't flatter yourself. Because the Holy Spirit knows you. The Holy Spirit knows you because God called you from the womb. And he named you. You think your mom and dad did? I don't think so. He named you. Praise God. As we close this morning, Hebrews 7.25, Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them.